Welcome to Is Your Website Holding Your Org Hostage? Set Your Site Free. Again, my name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup. I've been with the organization for a little more than six years. And prior to that, I spent about a decade working for small nonprofits in Washington, D.C. and Oakland, California, where I was regularly the accidental techie, having to develop new websites and figure out how to make updates on websites, and often in the situation of having my organization's website being held hostage myself. So I've lived this situation and feel for any of you on the phone who are in it as well. Also joining us today we have Steve Murphy, and he is – I've listed him here as a nonprofit web, build, web building pro because he really is. And after 25 years of working uh, uh, with two tech companies and software companies that he ran, he has decided to dedicate a lot of his time to giving back. And he's spent more than 2,500 hours dedicated to building and developing nonprofit websites pro bono. So we love people like Steve in our community right? for uh, taking his time to give back both in person and on events like this today. Also joining us is Kelly Antonucci who is the Nonprofit Outreach Manager at NPower in New York City. So we are really excited to have her joining us to share her expertise and where NPower provides a wide variety of on-site and consulting services for nonprofits throughout the New York area. And they have programs that also extend nationwide and we'll hear more about those later where you can access some support and community to get support for your programs. You'll also see Ali Bazdikian in the chat, and she is with us from TechSoup as the Interactive Events and Video Producer. She'll be there to grab and flag any of your questions for follow-up. So if you have any issues or, or tech problems, feel free to ask her during the webinar. And as questions move you, go ahead and post them in the chat, and she'll make sure that they're captured for our presenters. Looking at today's agenda, I'll do a quick introduction of TechSoup for those of you who may not be familiar with us. We'll have an opportunity to hear from you, our audience, about your experiences with websites and where you're at. This will help inform our presenters on what they'll talk about uh, in the sections following. Steve and Kelly will talk about a zero-cost checklist and what to look for to know whether you are held hostage and then talk about the life cycle of a website and how often you really should be forecasting changing and redesigning or rebuilding. They'll give you some options for new websites, new web builders, and how to update some of the existing sites that you may be captured by. And they'll talk about the Bill of Rights for websites and give you some next steps. We'll also have some time for Q&A, and we'll highlight some products that are out there that may help you get out of being trapped if you are. So TechSoup is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we are working toward the day when every nonprofit, charity, library on the planet can access the technology knowledge and resources to meet their mission. We do this in a variety of ways. In, since 1987 we have been doing this, and we are in more than 60 countries around the world. And we do this in a variety of ways including things like donation programs from Microsoft and Cisco and a whole slew of other companies that partner with us to bring their technology to the nonprofit sector. And we also do it by having events like this where we offer trainings and informational events to help you make the best decisions for your organization. So with that I'd like to go ahead and have you participate. Tell us how often are you able to update your website content. Go ahead and click on one of these radio buttons on your screen. We have 130 some people in the room right now and that number is sure to climb in the next few minutes. So we want to give just a moment for everyone to have the opportunity to participate in these couple of poll questions. It helps inform us, but it also helps inform you about where you are at and whether you are an outlier among other peers, or whether you are uh, you know, smack in the middle of nonprofits who are similar, similar to you. So I'm going to give just a few more seconds for everyone to participate. Okay, so it looks like uh, around 31%. It's almost a dead heat between daily and weekly. So that's great that you have a lot of people are in here able to update their sites pretty regularly. Uh, and about 25% say monthly. Uh, 
8.7, 9.5, it keeps changing at me, um, are yearly, and 2.6 are never, and then a little less than 2% don't have a website. So if we add that up, boy, my math skills, 35. So a little less than 40% say that they either can't do it more than monthly or never. And go ahead and click on this next one, and then we'll get to the fun content of the day. When is the last time your organization went through a web design or redesign project? So in the comments while people are responding to this, you won't be able to read each other's comments, but when we see things come in that we think are useful or interesting, we'll try and share those back out. Dan comments, we have the ability to update our site if we want to pay each time. So that is definitely a little bit of a restriction. Cindy comments um, that they are in the process of redesigning right now. So we didn't include that as an option. So that's great to point out that some of you may be in it at the moment. Anna comments that she can update her website quarterly. Greg and Jennifer say that they are in the process but having a hard time coordinating with their web design company. Some are in the final stages. So lots of people are in it right now. So that's great that you are moving forward with web design projects. And hopefully today's webinar will help inform and give you some ideas of how to make that even smoother and improve the process for you. So let me show these results really quickly so we can all see. So around 30% of people say that their website was last designed or redesigned three to five years ago, 19% five or more years ago, and 19 and almost 18% are either less than a year or in the past one to two years. So really helpful to see kind of the spread. And this is somewhat better than I was actually expecting based on some of the pre-survey registration. We thought we may have had a much bigger crowd of people that were stuck in the in the never or <laughs> five or more year categories. So this is great. I'd like to go ahead and have our presenters join us on the line now so they can talk about what it means to be held hostage, which some of you may personally feel deeply uh, at different times in your organization with your site, and to tell us how to get out of that, to give us some tips on how to move away from that process and, and into one that will be smoother and easier and more successful for you to communicate your services, your goals, and your mission more seamlessly to your audience. So welcome to the program. We're so glad to have you join us, Kelly. Well, thank you, Becky. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kelly Antonucci uh, here from NPower. And both Steve and I are very excited to have this time with you and be able to share this information. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump right in and, and start getting as much information from Steve as we can. Um, Steve, when you had first um, approached me about doing a webinar on this topic, um, the, just I had a kind of a, an aha moment and, and a good chuckle thinking about the name. How did you come up with the name? Um, are you being held hostage by your website? Yeah, the 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 way I came up with the name, and and I'm going to go back to the survey for just a. a, a just a quick second, Kelly, before I, I answer that question directly. Um, it appears I, much like uh, Becky, thought there would be many people on on this uh, webinar that maybe are, you know, being restricted in terms of updating their content. It seems like many of the folks are able to do that, but I also see that many people are um, have entertained a redesign in the last, uh, you know, two to five years. Uh, and I'm sure many are, are thinking about doing the same. So I just want to share with those folks, uh, kind of toward the last third of this, uh, uh, of what Kelly and I are going to talk about, we're going to share some very specific, uh, four real specific uh, topics that will help you as you go into those redesign phases to make sure that you are not held hostage. But to answer your question directly, Kelly, the um, in the last uh, Three and a half years, I've been working with nonprofits to improve their web presence, and I've worked with about 30 nonprofits on web projects specifically. And I noticed that um, over 80% of those folks that I worked with felt like they were held hostage or at least handcuffed by their site. 
An example, a kind of a classic example, is a nonprofit in Miami whose mission it was to, you know, provide books to grade schools in uh, Haiti, and uh, their website was displaying errors uh, on their donation page so that people could not donate. And the school year was coming up, and they relied on those donations for books. And so they were truly handcuffed from actually completing you know, one of their core missions by their website. And given the importance of websites to nonprofits um, and seeing how pervasive this problem seemed to be, I wondered you know, how it could be avoided. Okay. Wonderful, um, and hopefully we will have many um, tips to help nonprofits um, avoid this situation. What have you found um, to be some of the common signs um, that a nonprofit is being held hostage or handcuffed by their website? One of the first signs um, is that the content stale, and we've all seen examples of this. You know, kind of one common one would be that there's a recent news section on the website and uh, the last post in that area or the last recent news might be a year and a half ago and and that leaves our visitors with that feeling that maybe no one's home and uh, maybe an impression we don't want to leave and um, another common one is that um, you know that we look at a website and we just kind of think gosh that looks a little old or a little out of date and most of the folks on this call know that web websites are much like you know clothes or fashion. You know what looked good um, you know five years ago and was considered engaging is really may not be the case today. And websites really do have a shelf life. They are not a fire and forget project. Uh, the research shows that most first donors visit an organization's website prior to donating to get a, get a measure of the organization. And our websites, if they look out of date, it's sending the wrong message. Um, the other two are common examples would be that the website's no longer telling the full story of the organization. Organizations change, and our websites need to reflect or mirror that change. Um, and lastly, that the organization maybe is not supporting, or the website's not supporting the organization's needs. And a website, as most people know on this call, can help you recruit volunteers, and it can help you keep your community updated, it can increase your donations. But I've seen organizations be uh, handcuffed, and it has, their website has the opposite effect. Um, an example is much like Dan just mentioned in the chat a while back. Uh, I worked with this profit in, uh, nonprofit in Seattle who had to pay, just like Dan mentioned, had to pay the developer every time they needed this very simple change made to the website. And it got to the point they couldn't afford that, and so they stopped updating their current success stories uh, section of their website. They no longer updated their upcoming events calendar, and within a year they saw a 20% drop in donations. Wow. That, that, uh, that, is, that is amazing really how this has an impact on the nonprofits, and I actually have um, the same, same experience as you. Um, I had been speaking with a nonprofit in Massachusetts, and the executive director had been going out and doing a lot of outreach to the community and speaking at events and talking about their programs. And people would come up to her afterwards um, very, very enthused and energized and want to learn more and learn how they can get involved. And they would ask how they could get more information. Um, could they go to her website? And she was basically mortified to have to say, um, no, I, I'm sorry, we don't have this information on our website. So it was really um, causing a, a challenge for their organization. Yeah, that's a great example of you know, a website not telling the full story. And um, I'm just kind of thinking, thinking about this and wondering, do you have some type of, of a self-assessment tool that a nonprofit can use to see if they are being limited by their website? Yeah, one of the main goals uh, for me for this webinar is to dispel the myth that you need a technical person to uh, do updates to your site. Um, so really, this list, you should be able to, at no cost to you, be able to do the things on this list. You know, as an example, you should be able to upload photos. You should be able to add them to a new web page to, um, 
talk about current events that, that, that you have or have had or are coming up. You should be able to create a photo gallery of maybe the last fundraiser or the 10K run or, or whatever. But um, the point is, is that you should expect that you can do all the things on this list. Whether you need to do them or not is another question, but you should expect that you could. Um, Steve, I'm, I'm kind of curious because you said at no cost. Um, how would a nonprofit be able to do these updates at no cost? Yeah, good question. I, when I say non, no cost, what I'm really speaking of is that a non-technical person, whether that's a member of the nonprofit staff or it's a volunteer that helps the nonprofit, um, should be able to uh, do these updates. And so you should not have to pay people to do them. Um, these items sound fairly, uh, you know, like you might need to be a technical expert or have web programming experience. Are you sure that a non-technical person can do all of these things? <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it, um, Kelly, where this comes from is back in the day when, when websites were designed in the very early days, they were all designed in, very, you know, in a programming language, HTML or CSS and so on, and, and other languages. And um, at that, in that day and age, you had to be a programmer to really update the site. But much like Microsoft Word has enabled us all to be able to do um, – uh, uh, documents and be able to change fonts and add images and so on. There are tools in this day and age that um, allow non-technical people to be able to change content on a website. All right. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, um, in your experience, how is it that nonprofits get into situations where they have lost control of, of their website and the ability to make these updates? Yeah, so I'm sure some of the people on this call can relate to these. These are my statistics from the 30 projects that I have worked on in the last three and a half years. Um, an example of the top two, you know, some organizations experience both of the top two, a proprietary system or, or somebody's left. Uh, there's a nonprofit in Seattle that I worked with that, had, um, that used uh, class fees online registration as their primary funding source for their entire organization. And they, their developer left. And the developer built the website in a proprietary, um, with a, in a proprietary way. And they were unable to take online registrations any longer. So that was a, a, a real problem. Um, and when, we, when I speak of proprietary or closed, well, I'm, there could be a lot of uh, definitions of those topics or of those words, but I'm using the words in this case to say if it's proprietary or it's closed, it's requiring that a tech person be able, to, that a tech person is required to be able to do updates. And in, um, in this day and age, uh, hopefully we, we, we can avoid that. Okay. Um, I, have to, I have to tell you that I hear kind of the, these same scenarios all the time um, where a nonprofit reaches out to us and they're telling us that they are unable to update their website and uh, one of the board members who um, is no longer there had a cousin who had a sister um, who was, was starting a web development company and they were looking um, uh, for some clients to work with, or somebody had a college intern uh, that was able to, to do the work, and now that person is gone, and now they are basically in this situation where they are kind of stuck and, and tied to their current site. Yeah, and so that you know that's a, such a common example that you know, whether it's the developer or a key staff person, it's somebody who's knowledgeable about the website and how to update it. That person is is no longer available. Maybe they've taken another job. Maybe they've moved on for whatever reason. And so because of that, that, that um, ability to update the website now is, is no longer you know, within the organization's reach. And I'm, you know, we're suggesting some, some ways coming up here that maybe can help them with that. 
Okay. So if, um, as many of the nonprofits that are, that are typing in, in the, the chat, we can see, um, if a nonprofit is handcuffed by their website, what can they do? How do they get unstuck? Yeah, the, the, the solution is simple or can be simple. The execution is a bit more of a challenge. But the, what I'm suggesting is, is that they should make sure that their website is built with a popular website builder tool. And in this day and age, the term website builder or uh, CMS or content management system, they're, they're all used interchangeably. So um, making sure that their website is built with a popular website builder tool is a big, big first step. Okay. Um, Steve, I have to tell you, I feel like you just told me that the solution is to just go climb Everest and everything will be better. Um, are you saying that these nonprofits have to just throw out their current site and start over from scratch? Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that, that sounds scary, and I certainly don't want to leave that impression, uh, Kelly. No, what, what I'm suggesting is, is that, as we mentioned um, a, a few minutes ago, all websites have a shelf life, and therefore, just like clothes and fashion, they, they, they should change. And I can see from the, the survey that m many, many of the, of the folks on this call follow what is considered best practices, meaning that they recognize their website has a shelf life, and they um, know that it needs to, you know, it needs to have a refresh or a redesign every. And some people say every best practices are one to three years. Some people say every two to five. But let's just say that you know somewhere in the period of one to five years, um, there should be a, a conscious planning cycle in place that says we are going to refresh our website, and that really becomes the ideal time to look into. Um, maybe if you're on a proprietary system or not on a popular CMS, moving to one. Okay. Um, cause you, you definitely had me a little, a little uh, frightened there to begin with, but it sounds like these are all things that really every organization um, can, can incorporate and think about in, in their planning cycles. But I am very curious as to how much extra time would moving to a website builder or a CMS add um, to this planning cycle because I have to tell you that I just got off of the phone uh, this morning with an executive director that has spent 12 months working on getting their current site up and running, and I cannot possibly go back to her and say um, that if she wanted to move to a CMS, it would take two years um, to be able to do this. Right, and if that person's on this call and it's just taken 12 months to do it, they're going, oh my goodness, there's no way I'm going to, I can, I can, do that again. That was such a long and painful process. So, yeah, what, what I'm what I'm really suggesting is is that probably that person that you were talking to, Kelly, that was maybe their first website. Was that true? Yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah. So the idea that you take 12 months to build your first one is is not a, maybe uncommon. There's so much work that goes into just getting the content put together. Um, that in all of that work is is will will not be thrown away. All that work is going to fold right into the the refresh project, and then if you decide to move to, to convert to a CMS, it would fold into that. So let let me get specific. I've personally done several of these projects where I've taken a nonprofit from a proprietary website uh, that uh, it, to a popular web one using a popular website builder. And let's just say, and this wouldn't be uncommon, let's just say that there's a, you'd plan two months to do a website refresh so that the fact you already have a website and you're now going to do a refresh in that one to five, per, one to five year period. Um, if it took two months to do that refresh, it might take three months to convert to the CMS. So I'm suggesting, and it's not a bad estimate, and it's going to vary on a case-by-case -case basis, certainly, but I'm suggesting that an estimate of about 33% addition to the, to the project is not a bad estimate. 
Okay. All right. Well, that, again, that, that sounds something that, that is very doable and I think most people um, can incorporate into their plan. Um, but I just wanted to uh, go back and talk about why um, this is so important to look at using a website builder or CMS. Yes. So just to review that key point, the, so that you as an organization have control of your website and are not being held hostage for money reasons or for technical reasons, you want to have your website built using a popular website building tool so that non-technical people, uh, either people on your staff or volunteers, can keep your website current, which is probably very important to you know, the image that you're projecting. Okay. And then I also heard you mention um, not just Website Builder, but the importance of using a popular Website Builder. Um, can you explain that a little bit more, why it's so important to choose a popular CMS or Website Builder? Sure. Um, according to Wikipedia, there are you know, over, well over 100 uh, CMSs or Website Builders available. So you want to pick a popular one because it's going to increase the the chances, the probability that you can find a developer who can help you when it comes to the refresh stage or a volunteer to help you keep your website current. And so if we think back that, you know, at least my experience has been, you know, 40% of the projects were handcuffed because a key person left, it may not be a bad idea to just plan that key people are going to leave. And so the, you want to have a popular website builder so the probability of finding a replacement is much higher. Okay. Um, it it kind of seems like a no-brainer. So I'm just curious, aren't all sites built with a website builder? It does seem like a no-brainer, and the answer is no, they're not. And um, as of uh, September of this month, or September of this year, 2014, 62% uh, of websites um, are not built with a website builder or a CMS. So if there are folks on this, uh, on this webinar that are, don't have their website built in such a way, you know, they should not feel badly because two-thirds of the worldwide websites uh, would fall into that category. But those folks that have not had a website built with a website builder, that often tends to be one of the primary, if not the primary, reason they are handcuffed. Wow. Um, and I'm curious, um, what do you, have you found to be some of the popular website builders or CMS systems that um, nonprofits are using? Yeah, and, and there could be great debate on this list. Um, so there could be many others added here, but this is not a bad list to start with uh, to, as a begin point. You know, here are eight. Okay. And what would you say is the most popular? Yeah, so um, again, based on statistics as of this month, um, for all websites that, were, uh, that have as their foundation uh, a website builder, um, WordPress dominates by 61%, you know, meaning that 61% of those uh, sites were built using WordPress. Joomla, you know, about 8%, and so on. But um, there are you know, nearly a billion websites uh, on the World Wide Web. So even the ones toward the bottom that have a fraction of the percent, it still represents a very large number, and they could be considered in the popular category. Okay. And I've seen a lot of the comments going back and forth on the, on the chat, um, and I've heard a lot of nonprofits just in, in, uh, that I speak with talking about Wix, and I always hear WordPress come up. Um, do they all do the same thing, or they do, have, do they have different uh, benefits or, or features? Yeah, so um, they don't all do the same thing, and it really depends on the goal of the organization. And, and of course, kind of, uh, you know, website design 101 starts with, you know, what is the role that your website, you know, is meant to play for your organization? And if it's meant to play more of a brochure role, it's not a, a very dynamic role. It's simple. 
um, and there doesn't, you don't plan to have lots of update or lots of interaction and, and, and lots of features, then um, the, 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 the website building tools on the left would, are primarily drag and drop tools and are easy to use and, and quicker to learn and so on. The one, if you have more uh, high-end requirements, the one on, ones on the right, while they require a bit more learning, they have a, um, a fair bit more um, uh, capability. Uh, let me give you an example. WordPress, for instance, has over 32,000 plugins, many of them free. Now, what's a plugin? A plugin is something that can be added to a website that adds a feature or adds a, a, a function, so it can make a website more powerful. So things like, for instance, you want to have a Facebook or Twitter comments mirrored on your website so that your website has a, a lot of activity, activity and it's dynamic and so on. Um, or you want to, or you want to go look for an event calendar. You'd find many event calendar plugins, so you could find those kinds of things easily. So, um, so there you go, Kelly. So it, it, this is a simplistic analysis, but it, it's not a, you know, it's not a bad starting point again. Okay, great. And it sounds like really there's not one right answer. It really depends on what the nonprofit needs their website to do and what resources they have internally to be able to, um, you know, to, to dedicate time to making um, the updates. Uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, people on the call at this point are wondering what their sites are actually built with. Um, and I wanted to see if you had any suggestions um, as to how they can find out what their current site is built with. Yeah, there there are uh, there are tools on the internet um, that will help you uh, evaluate whether your what your website was built with, and here are some links, or you can just Google, you know, what CMS is this, and what 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 will typically typically happen is there will be a place on the site that lets you uh, type in or or paste in your URL or or the you know how people get to your website, and you type you. You know, paste in that link, and it'll go out and analyze the site, and it will give you an idea whether your website was built with the Website Builder tool, and if so, which one. Okay. Uh, so hopefully, people will go after the presentation and just confirm what their site is built on. Um, and if they find out that it is built using a CMS or Website Builder, what can they do um, to get assistance with getting their their website updated? Yeah, so that would be the good news that they maybe didn't even know that it was built with a with a CMS, and um, so they're um, they're in probably in pretty good shape. And so the my suggestion is that they reach out and find a volunteer who will help them uh, train their staff or train a, one of their volunteers uh, to keep their website. Uh, updated and to teach them how to use the tool. So in that example, Kelly, you had in the beginning where you know we have an intern who comes in for the summer and helps us you know get our content current and all that and now the intern is left. Maybe we just need to teach another member of our staff how to you know do similar things and there are many, many volunteers available that know these CMSs that can help you. Okay, great. Well, it, it sounds like we may have just given uh, the keys uh, uh, to freedom to maybe about a third of the people on the call. Um, but based upon your, your statistics earlier, we know that two-thirds of the websites are not built using a CMS or a website builder. Uh, and I just want to make sure that those people can actually um, can convert to a CMS system. Yeah, and, and so again, I, uh, as I mentioned, I've done it personally. I've known many developers who have done it you know, many times to help a nonprofit convert to a CMS. But for those on the call that might be a little nervous or just want to see what the size of the task might be, you know, my suggestion is that they reach out and have a volunteer look at their site and, and give an estimate about what it would take to, to get there. And then they should also recognize that um, they're going to need a developer, a technical person, to, to help them with that. And they probably are going to need somebody dedicated on their side to assist the developer with the content and so on. So um, very possible, and, and you don't have to bite it off right now. You, know, just, you could reach out and just kind of find out 
you know, um, how tough would it be, and, and let somebody help you evaluate that. Okay. Well, I think you have made a very, very compelling case for uh, converting to a website builder or CMS. But I just wanted to ask you this question: Is if nonprofits do go ahead um, and switch over, could they still end up um, being uh, handcuffed to their website or in a, in a situation where they can't make updates? Yeah, unfortunately, the answer is yes. And many on these, this call indicated at the very beginning that, that they are familiar with, you know, they go through a refresh every year, every, you know, three or four or five years. And so they are taking on that kind of a project. And it's, it's the upfront preparation of that project that can really help you avoid being held hostage. I'll give you an example of a nonprofit in Seattle that I worked with last year who had a, um, a developer and there was uh, problems with the developer and the developer got upset. The developer actually built their site on WordPress but then disabled the ability of uh, non-technical people to be able to actually update it. So while we would say, hey, the website was built using a very popular CMS, you know, we think we we're, we're kind of can do the happy dance in the end zone. That's not always the case. And so let's talk about some things that that organization and maybe some on this call might be able to do. Okay, so I see you have the Bill of Rights here, and uh, the first one is to own your own site. Um, can you clarify what you mean by own your own site? Doesn't everybody have the, uh, the ownership of their website? Right. Um, yeah, the answer is not, no, they, they don't always, but they, they should. And with just a little preparation, you can make sure that that's the case. So just in context, an organization, um, most know this on this call, Expect, should expect that they're going to pay for two things. They're going to pay for their domain name, and their domain name is that thing that lets you type in and get to the website, and maybe it's myorganization.org or it's whatever, but there is a, typically a yearly fee for a domain name, and the, the fee can range from 10 to 15 bucks, but just in round terms. So there's a domain name fee. And then the second thing is, is that you need to have the web, your website hosted by what's called a hosting company who has you know, large banks of servers that are connected to the Internet. And typically you're going to pay that company some, some – it can vary dramatically, but somewhere between 5 to 10 or 15 bucks a month is, is not uncommon. Now, Kelly, one of the problems that I have seen uh, with several nonprofits is that they got held hostage because the developer said to them, hey, I'll get your uh, – you're very busy. You know, you don't want to have to deal with this domain thing. There's some technical things involved there. You don't want to have to deal with, you know, setting up a web hosting company and setting, deciding what plan you want and all that. I'll take care of all that for you. And then you can just pay me a monthly fee, uh, and, and you don't have to worry about it. And of course, the problem with that is that if there becomes a fallout between the developer and the uh, nonprofit, the nonprofit doesn't have the domain registered in their name because they didn't pay for it. They don't have the hosting service registered in their name because they didn't pay for it. And that developer can just pull the plug or, or, or shut it down. Wow. I, I have to ask you to, to share the story um, of the developer that was hosting the nonprofit's website in a rather uh, unusual location. <laughs> yes. The very first uh, nonprofit that I worked with, um, they found a developer who um, was in college, and it was a, a young lady who wanted to make this a career, and she was very enthusiastic and really helpful and said to them, you know, I'll, not only will I pay for your domain and pay for uh, and, and your uh, hosting, I'll actually take care of your hosting to the point that you won't have to pay anything. I'll actually host it on one of my servers. And what turned out 
was that she was living with her mother as she's going to college, and the server was in her mother's bedroom, and the nonprofit and she had a falling out, and she literally went and unplugged the cable and lights out. Oh my God, that that has to be my my all time favorite Steve, Steve Murphy story. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, pretty pretty dramatic. Yes. So, um, so so don't do, you know don't take the easy way out. It can sound like it's easy, but make sure you own it. Yes. Um, and then you also talked about owning your code. Can you talk a little bit more about what that means? Because I thought if you're using a website builder um, or a CMS, there wasn't any code. Yeah, um, and, and this gets just a touch more technical, but I'm going to keep it very simple. The, um, sometimes, not all the time, the developer needs to add some custom programming code to do something for the nonprofit's uh, website, whether it's to add a feature or to make it look a certain way or whatever. And one of the things that I'm suggesting is that you make very explicit up front in the contract or the letter of agreement is that any code developed by the uh, developer uh, for building the nonprofit's website is owned by the nonprofit, not owned by the developer. So oftentimes this is never even approached, and what will happen is that the developer assumes that they own the code, and again we get into that if, uh, if there's a fallout, they can pull the code, which may start causing problems with the site or may actually take the site down. Okay. And that's not anything unusual. Mo most developers wouldn't balk if you asked to add that to the contract? They would not, and most developers would recognize that you knew what you were doing because you're asking for that. And so the, I got involved in a situation where this was not made explicit and the organization was left you know, pursuing lawyers, and no one wants to do that. No, def definitely not. Um, and then the third right you have is uh, the ability to maintain um, content. So what are some things that the nonprofit's um, staff should be able to do, and how can the nonprofit make sure um, to incentivize the developer to properly train their staff? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to take that same list that we, we have up here now that, that we showed before, but to take that same list and make it part of the original um, agreement or understanding. In other words, that the organization says, Look, my expectation is when this project is done that a non-technical person on my staff can do these things. And then once that's set up front, now the expectation is set, and that the nonprofit, whether it's the executive director or manager or whomever, does not sign off on the project until they've actually seen a member of their staff be able to do most or all of these things. And of course, if there's a payment, there's no final payment until you've seen that. Or if there's just sign off, you actually validate as as a manager of the organization that this, in fact, you know, somebody non-technical can do it. Because and that would, of course, avoid the problem that I mentioned in the Seattle nonprofit, where the you know the, where the developer went out of his way to make sure that only he could be. You know, he was required to do all updates, and therefore they had to pay him. So this would vo avoid that situation. Okay. And then the last um, right that you have is about protecting your site. And again, that, that sounds something that's more geared towards a technical um, person. How complicated is protecting your site? Yeah. So, so the protecting your site can be kept quite simple. Just see that you have backups. Uh, see proof that you have backups being made on a regularly scheduled basis and that you have access to those backups. Uh, and what I mean by that is that you have access to the folder where those backups uh, are held. 
and you don't have to understand what's inside those uh, files or what's inside the folder. You just need to have access to the folder because if something happens where you need to get another developer involved or your site gets hacked or whatever, you, the first thing that a developer would want to do is to have those backups so that you know, we, could, we can reconstruct your site. Okay. Wonderful, because no, nobody wants to be uh, in that situation where their site is hacked, and it's a horrible, horrible uh, feeling. It is a terrible feeling, and I worked with a nonprofit a couple of years ago in North Carolina that um, had that situation where they were paying their developer, and they, they, they got tired of it, and so they stopped updating their site, and their site got old, and their site actually got hacked, and they didn't have any backups. And they literally spent two and a half months, I helped them, reconstruct their site from paper. Oh my gosh, wow. And had yeah. they had backups, we could have had it up in a day or two. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's uh, re really a critical thing. And as you said, you, we think of backing up all these other things, um, photos and uh, documents, but, but a really key thing is to make sure that your website is backed up as well. Yeah, we do. We think of, yes, that's a great point. We think about, you know, in our organizations that our, our servers have to be backed up or that our desktops have to be backed up or our laptops have to be backed up, but somehow the idea that our website should be backed up somehow gets missed. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, the Bill of Rights is, is extremely helpful. Um, I like to talk about all of these things when I talk to nonprofits that call me about their website issues. Um, and I just wanted to kind of quickly recap some of the things that we talked about um, during this session. Um, so if you get off this call and you're energized and you want to um, really empower yourself and your organization uh, to be able to update your website, just a quick run through. Um, so first thing is find out what your site is built with. Uh, we provided the links in the presentation. And then you also want to make sure is who actually owns your domain name and who is hosting it. Uh, we talked about reasons why you really need a reputable um, hosting site. Uh, if you're not on one, uh, currently you definitely want to get on one uh, as soon as possible. And then look at your current contract with the developer and ensure that you would own any customized um, code that was done for your website. Also confirm that you have backups. Um, when is the most recent backup and how often are they scheduled? Because again, if you're hacked, you don't want to be down for months and recreating your site from paper. And then Steve has created that zero cost checklist. Uh, so definitely I think it's a great tool to go through and see how many of those things can you um, go ahead and do on that checklist because really you should be able to do all of them. And then identify an internal staff person that might be a good candidate for website training. I think Steve ta talked about the fact that really if you can create um, a Word document, you can in a few hours of training learn how to make these updates uh, to your website. Yeah, I think that's a great recap, uh, Kelly. And, and you um, have been asking the questions during this, in the, in this webinar. Uh, let me turn the tables, and uh, albeit a softball question, uh, if, I, if I can imagine that there are some people on this you know, webinar who are going, you know, I feel like I'm you know, at least handcuffed by my, by my website, but you're starting to use terms like domain and hosting and CMS, and I'm getting confused. Um, you know, Kelly, what can they do to get help? Sure. Um, yeah, th th thanks, Steve, for an, e an easy softball question at the end of our webinar. Um, but I think you make a great point is that we did cover a lot, and I don't think either one of us expected anyone attending today's session would come out of this now being a website expert. But hopefully you have learned enough to start asking uh, kind of those key questions. Um, and the thing that I would recommend is really to go ahead and speak with someone that is a website expert uh, and can really help you assess where you are and, and how to get to a place where you can make regular updates. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the next obvious question um, is, well, how can I speak with an expert? And there are many, many wonderful volunteers out there, just like Steve, that can help nonprofits um, with their website. And there are different ways to get connected to them. So there are um, organizations such as NPower. Um, that's where I work. We have a program called the Community Corps, and we work to connect skilled technical volunteers like Steve with nonprofits that need assistance. Um, it's free to join. It's very easy. You can post 
um, projects requesting assistance. And we have um, the link here, uh, and it will also be in the email that Becky sends out later. And one of the things that I would start with is a website review and assessment project, because again, it really kind of looks at where you're, you are currently um, and then makes recommendations for you as to what are the next steps. And then we also have projects for website updates, um, website training, but there's a, there's a whole category there of website projects. And then there are also other volunteer organizations uh, where you can post projects for requesting assistance. There's Volunteer Match and Idealist. Um, and Becky, I think uh, we are done and ready to turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much for that, both of you. Um, we have a lot of other resources available, and we will get to Q&A in just a moment. So TechSoup, um, and this will be included in the post-event email. So in, in addition to the community core that um, Kelly just pointed you to, we have a lot of web building resources on TechSoup's site because we know that a lot of you are going it alone. Um, everything from a toolkit that has a lot of great resources on simple things you can do. Um, we have have these different articles and past webinars on tips on how to redesign, tips for creating sites. Um, we have an RFP library which was something that a few people asked about. So an RFP is a request for proposals which is something that you may want to write up um, basically defining kind of the scope and the goals and what you want your site to do if you are looking at a whole new web project. Um, this RFP library that we have has samples and examples, and has a lot of great information in that. And then also uh, one of the resources I want to make sure people are aware of is that we have a whole design and web building community forum where experts and consultants, people like Steve, um, participate and answer questions and help recommend things. So for questions like what's your, how do you know which host you have for your website? Or can you recommend a good web host or a reputable one? Those are the kinds of questions that every day they are answering in the forums. In fact, I just saw a post there on that yesterday. So great resources. Um, and I also want to highlight really quickly just a few web building tools and donations through TechSoup. So we know that some were mentioned earlier like WordPress is free, Wix is free, Weebly is free. There's a whole bunch. We also in some of those articles compare some of those tools in depth. So if you're looking for a whole new tool to use, um, you can find resources to compare them. This list is specifically for tools that offer their services as donations to TechSoup users. And there is no fee to join TechSoup, but there may be a small admin fee depending on the service you opt with. Um, but GoDaddy, big reputable name for web hosting, but they also offer their web builder service. So it is a full-fledged CMS and hosting service that they are donating to nonprofits. And they just launched only a couple weeks ago with us. So we are excited to have them. NetSuite offers a light content management system. Um, Huddle is a content management system that also offers collaboration. So if you have staff in different places or branches, um, it allows you to have online collaboration and project management tools. Wikispaces is a wiki tool, but that actually can work really well for a website tool depending on the type of site that you need and the type of content you are looking to get out there and share. Uh, CitySoft is another content management si system. If you are looking for a really big, complicated, um, you know, multi Faceted site, SharePoint is a really great uh, tool, but that's not for the faint of heart. Uh, it's something you definitely would need some technical support and help on. Um, for those of you who asked about e-commerce sites, Shopify uh, is an e-commerce tool that is donated to organizations. So for those of you who have a storefront or sell um, gear or t-shirts, that's one to look into. And then the last two are for those of you who may have a website but you want to make a mobile friendly website or have fundraising through a mobile site or text message. So those two are also available in our catalog. So check those out. And I'm going to jump into questions. We only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to rush through some bigger topics that came in. Um, Steve, do you recommend that people start with a request for proposals or an RFP when they go into this process? I think I think depending on the size of the project and the size of the organization, RFPs are are, are very helpful. But I, I know many nonprofits where that's an intimidating project, and um, I've personally been involved in, in many where. 
the nonprofit just reaches out and says, you know, I just need help. I would like to get my re- website refreshed or I need a brand new one or whatever. And, you know, as a volunteer, we just talk about it and we develop a game plan, and that can be just as effective. Great. Um, you know, a lot of questions came in asking about the average cost for websites, and I know that that's kind of a, a big question because there is no average. Um, but you know, especially if you're a smaller organization, how much do you think is really a reasonable budget for somebody to come into this and say, you know, we need to put some money into it maybe, um, or maybe they can really do it all for free? So what's your opinion on cost? That That is a very tough question. So I'll answer that in a very general way and with the expectation that there's a thousand exceptions. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 to 5,000 is not an unreasonable number for building a website. We've cer- I've certainly seen them up into the 50,000 range for very complex ones. And I've also personally built uh, with people uh, with other volunteers, websites uh, that are quite involved at, at no charge. So I think reaching out to the volunteer community and kind of getting a, a feel if somebody could take that project on, you know, you could expect that you could get one done at no charge. Great. And you know, if you are looking for volunteers, I know that you know Kelly mentioned Idealist, um, and you can also post in our community forums. N10 has 501 tech clubs where you can post, and they're in different cities around the country, um, where you can post that you're looking for some help and you may find volunteers. And I loved one of the ideas shared in the chat by a different participant we broadcast out that they connected with the local community college's marketing program, and the students actually built their organization a new website. Um, so that's a great thought too on how to do these programs or do these upgrades without necessarily having the funds to do so. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we have a the, 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 Go ahead, sorry. Oops, sorry. I was just going to say the one thing I would suggest is, is that please recognize that y- you're going to need to be involved pretty deeply. And so it requires an effort on your side even if it's a volunteer um, even if you're engaging a volunteer. So just, you know, just plan that you, you're, it's going to require resources on your side, yours being the nonprofits. Right. And I think you know, making sure that no matter who you work with, that you're looking at that checklist and you're going over it with the volunteer, the developer, or the company, the host, to make sure that you can do those things after that volunteer decides to move on to a different project or moves away um, so that you aren't held hostage again. We are at just about the top of the hour. There's a lot of questions we didn't get to answer. So what we'll try to do is we will do a roundup of some of these questions in the form of a blog post that answers many of them. And we can follow up uh, with a second email to you sometime next week hopefully with answers to many of your questions that we didn't have time for today. So I'm really sorry that we didn't. Um, I want to just thank Steve and Kelly for taking the time to really you know, share this expertise with us. And I think some of those checklists are really valuable to be able to walk away with and the links just to be able to figure out what you're hosted on now and how to get away from those things if you are held hostage. Um, a couple of upcoming dates that are important. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in our Story Makers contest, the deadline for submissions for that is tomorrow, the 26th of September. So if you've started that process, make sure you complete it by end of day tomorrow so that you can be uh, eligible for those $5,000 grand prizes. Um, then we'll have a webinar next Tuesday at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific Time or noon Eastern with Skype on Skyping out of the office, how to use that for business purposes. We will talk about engaging volunteers using Yammer and how to connect and collaborate with staff, volunteers, and board members on the 9th of October. And there are many more to come. You can access all of our webinars at that link on that slide that you will get in the post-event email. Thank you again Steve and Kelly. Thanks to Ali for helping on the back end. And lastly, thank you to our webinar sponsor ReadyTalk for providing the use of this platform for our ability to present these webinars to you on a regular basis. We are using ReadyTalk 500 which is also available in TechSoup's catalog. When the screen closes, please take a moment to complete the post-event survey to help us to continue to improve our webinar programming to best meet your needs. Thank you so much everyone and have a terrific day. Bye-bye.